The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. This is Susan Terrio. I'm the director of the College and Career Readiness and Success Center here at AIR. And I'm really pleased to bring to you today um, this webinar on strengthening college and career readiness for students with disabilities. Um, before we get started, I'd love to give you a little bit of information about the College and Career Readiness and Success Center. We are a federally funded content center um, that focuses on supporting states, districts, and their schools in implementing um, a coherent set of college and career readiness strategies and developing visions for college and career readiness. And um, to that end, we focus on building um, state and local capacity to implement these policies and strategies. And we do that through multiple way strategies, including providing um, direct technical assistance, thought partnership, um, developing tools and resources that can enhance the ability of um, implementation to be consistent over time. Um, and we provide a combination of targeted and intensive support. And through those um, experiences with particular states and districts, we try to develop some universal um, products. And what you're going to hear about today is, uh, the framing for today is one of those universal products um, that we've tried to develop to enhance the ability of states and districts to really think about ways to integrate um, efforts to support students with disabilities as well as um, into their broader college and career readiness expectations for all students. And to that end, I'd like to introduce um, oh, I do need to mention one more thing about engaging with us. So there is an opportunity um, to provide post-event feedback, and we do have a survey that after the, at the conclusion of this webinar, we'd love for you to respond to. Um, it's super important to us because it really helps us enhance our work. We honestly listen to that and try to um, make improvements based on your suggestions. Additionally, the webinar is being recorded, and you can um, you can find the archived webinar a few days after this um, live session on the CCRS Center uh, webpage. So with that said, I would love to introduce um, Tessie Bailey, who will serve as the moderator for this panel. Um, Tessie is a Principal Technical Assistant Consultant at the American Institute for Research. She has a substantial amount of expertise in um, strategies to support and improve educational outcomes for students with disabilities, and um, she's really um, an expert in her own right. And so with that, I hand it over to Tessie. Thank you so much, Susan. And I'm really pleased to, to be today's moderator. And I'm also pleased to really introduce our other presenters. So our first presenter, um, I, I will do an overview um, that will sort of set us up. And then Christine Johnson is going to follow. And she's a senior research associate with the George, uh, George Washington University Center for Rehabilitation Counseling, Research, and Education. And she has over 25 years of experience in the field of vocational rehabilitation. Christine's technical expertise of concentration includes performance evaluation, and you'll hear about some of that today, and improvement, systems change, strategic planning, quality assurance, and policy and streamlined procedures. Her areas of interest include career counseling, vocational assessment, job development, uh, CRP staff competencies, and disability law and policy. We have two colleagues from uh, Delaware today, and Dale Matusevich um, has been with the Delaware Department of Education since 2008 as the Education Associate for Secondary and, sec Secondary and Transition Services. And prior to his position, he was employed at the Virginia Department of Education's Training and Technical Assistance Center at Radford University. And while a special education teacher for the Roanoke School District, public school district in Roanoke, Virginia, he taught elementary, middle, and high school levels in a variety of settings. In addition to teaching, he has a, uh, been a mental health counselor. He has an undergraduate degree in psychology from the Hampton Sydney College and a master's degree in special education from Radford University. And Dale has also served as the president for the National Division on Career and Development and uh, transition, so DCDT, many of you are familiar with that. 
as well as other board positions, where he still coordinates the DCDT strand for the Annual Council for Exceptional Children Convention. Um, Hunter Matusevich is currently pre-employment career counselor at the Delaware Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. She received her undergraduate degree in psychology from Coastal Carolina University and her master's degree from the University of Oklahoma in special education with an emphasis in secondary transition and applied behavior analysis. She has been working with children and young adults with autism using ABA therapy, as well as working with young adults with developmental and intellectual disabilities attending post-secondary programs, as well as a variety of universities. She is continuing her education at the University of Kansas, where she'll be working towards a, a PhD in special education, focusing on supports and services for transition age students and students with more significant disabilities. And then Beth Ratway is a senior consultant at uh, in-state services at the American Institutes for Research. She has over 20 years experience, experience working with state agencies, intermediate regional service agencies, and school districts focusing on implementation science and design and implementation of college and career readiness standards. Her extensive knowledge and work with the standard, standards have allowed her to support state and district level technical assistant networks focusing on designing and implementation of career, college and career readiness. She has also worked with states to develop research-based processes to help SEAs and LEAs strategically think through the development of career academies and pathways. And she's also uh, support states in developing career pathway curriculum modules and tools to integrate employability skills into the college and career readiness um, standards. Oops. Not too fast there. So we'd like to start off today's webinar with a brief introduction of the current education and workforce, workforce trends that prompted the update of the new resource, developing a college and career readiness workforce and analysis of ESSA, Perkins, IDEA, and WIOA. The original resource, as many of you may know, did not include IDEA. So the information that you see here comes from the Center on Education and Workforce at Georgetown University and represents mostly national numbers. Now we know that the numbers do look different across states, regions within states, and for different industries. However, the general point is the same. Increasingly, jobs of the future are requiring some sort of post-secondary education and our current education to workforce pipeline is not going to produce enough workers with the right training and education to fill those jobs. I wanna be clear that when we refer to post-secondary education, we are referring to career and technical uh, credentials as well as two-year degrees, four-year degrees, and advanced degrees. Individuals with disabilities are, uh, con uh, uh, in addition to our workforce. And unfortunately, they are less likely to be employed compared to individuals without disabilities. The data that you see here was published in our graphic, why is career and technical education important for employment success for students with disabilities? And it shares that the US Department, US Bureau of Labor Statistics found significant differences in employment rates for those with disabilities, 28%, versus those without disabilities, which is 73%. I think what's more alarming is the data that's on the right side. And it shows that low employment levels persisted even when individuals with disabilities obtained college degrees. Now, lack of post-secondary readiness may be um, a contributing factor. About 20% of students entering four-year institutions require remediation, and more than half of students who are entering two-year institutions require remediation. And this includes individuals with and without disabilities. Remedial education is, can be costly for students, um, and it also leads to a decrease in their persistence in graduating. Lack of preparedness can also result in lower post-secondary enrollment, particularly for students with disabilities. While 84% of individuals with disabilities have enrolled in post-secondary institutions at some point, only around 61% of individuals with disabilities enroll. And finally, only 60% of students who enter a four-year institution graduate within six years. And these rates are much lower for certain populations. 
You'll notice here that the data for Black and Hispanic students graduate at lower rates um, in the general population, but this is much more significant uh, for individuals with disabilities who identify as Black and Hispanic. As we consider creating an education to workforce pipeline and better connecting students with workforce, we must also ensure that they have equal opportunities for all students and access to workforce opportunities. I wanna be clear too that the challenges um, don't just lie in post-secondary readiness. Uh, we've heard from employers about increasing needs of employees with the crucial employability skills and that a workforce comprised of employees with these skills is necessary for industry growth and success. And you'll see that employability skills is cited as one of the biggest factors in employee success. For this project, we posited that students of today and of the future need a new paradigm. No longer can we look at a two-track approach for education where some kids are on an academic track and others are on a technical track. And instead, we need to move towards a system where all students are going to uh, sort of be part of a trifecta uh, or have a trifecta of skills that include both academic and technical as well as employability skills. And in order for us to do this, we have to coordinate a lot of factors to create aligned education to workforce pipeline. This includes looking at our academic and technical skill knowledge that we're providing to students, what are the employer and labor market demands? What are student interests and applications to the real world? And what are some of the technical knowledge and on, on the job training that students need? And our project intended to identify existing levers for aligning these factors into a coherent pipeline. ESSA, Perkins 5, IDEA and um, WIOA play an important and complementary roles in educating the country's workforce and providing the academic, technical, and employability skills need to be, needed to be successful. Creating this coherent education to workforce pipeline requires aligning efforts across the four laws and their key stakeholders. In the document that was presented um, earlier by Susan, and as I mentioned myself that this uh, presentation is focusing on outlines each of the or describes each of the acts in the document. For our analysis um, of opportunities and alignment of alignment and leveraging the four acts to develop a college and career readiness workforce for students with disabilities, the CCRS team used qualitative research methods to analyze the four laws including legislation, regulatory guidance, and non-regulatory guidance. The laws were analyzed using the College and Career Readiness and Success Organizer pictured here. The organizer, which is available on the CCRS website, defines the many elements that impact a student's college and career readiness across the four overarching domains. In developing the document, we received extensive feedback from state CTE, directors from OCTA and from two state reviewers. The findings of our results were published in three resources. The first resource, which we'll be referring to extensively today, summarizes the content of the analysis. For each of the four quadrants that were in the graphic prior to, we briefly summarized the themes for how each of the laws, um, the, th the four laws discuss and address the indicators. Further, the brief includes summary tables for specific titles and sections of the laws that are, that are discussed as across the ind indicators. Two other resources, the state and local planning workbook and an interactive lookup tool are also available to support planning and we'll introduce those towards the end. We will be highlighting four key opportunities we found aligning the four acts. The first is providing rigorous academics ensuring work, the second is ensuring workforce readiness. The third is providing personalization of supports. And then finally, providing educator supports. <clears throat> so I'm gonna share the results in two parts to allow my colleagues an opportunity to go deeper into the findings and um, applications at the state and national level. If you have any questions for myself or any of the presenters at any time, please feel free to uh, input them into the question box. 
So the first section of the CCRS organizer, which I showed before, looks at the alignment in goals and expectations. And specifically, it looks at what students should know and be able to do to support, to achieve college and career readiness. In our findings, um, we found that the acts collectively support rigorous uh, academic expectations. As you can see, both ESSA and Perkins 5 support dual enrollment and AP courses. In addition, all four acts have goals for providing students with rigorous and comprehensive education that includes academics, employability skills, as well as technical skills. There are also opportunities for leveraging the four acts to ensure workforce readiness. You can see that each of the acts supports the development of employability skills, employment skills, workforce preparation, authentic workforce learning experiences. Now, what you'll also notice is that not um, all of the acts cover the same thing. And so it's important for us to look at how do we, how do we leverage each of them to address certain areas. The next section of the CCRS organizer, which we will look at the align, um, alignment of, is the outcomes and measures. And this looks at how do we measure expectations for college and career readiness and success. I'm going to pass this to my colleague, Christine Johnson from WinTAC. He's going to share some examples of alignment in this area, specifically across WIOA and IDEA. All right, thank you very much, Tessie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am with the Workforce Innovation Technical Assistance Center. This is a uh, known as WinTAC, it's a national TA center uh, designed to help state vocational rehabilitation agencies and partners um, be able to uh, develop the skills and processes that they need to meet the requirements of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or as you've heard us say, uh, under the acronym uh, WIOA. Um, I'm going to make sure that you, if nothing else, um, make sure that you have the website um, here to further explore more about um, the WinTAC site and the requirements for the VR agencies under the law. Um, by going to www.wintac.org. Specifically, I um, focus on the area of pre-employment transition services. And you'll see this slide also has that um, area for you to specifically go to and learn more. One of the uh, requirements for the state VR agencies is that they are now required to set aside a certain proportion of their federal funds to specifically serve students with disabilities in the area of pre-employment transition services. Um, ah, sorry there, Tessie, is that? All right, there, there we go. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit right now about um, how this legislation uh, really has us doing a, a new way of doing business. So Tessie's told us about this framework now that under WIOA, existing education and workforce services are kind of going from that separate silo type of system to integration. Um, one of the ways we, they're measuring this is that there are common performance measures across all of the WIOA partners. And the primary indicator for performance for all the states now is the effectiveness in serving employers. So WIOA um, and the Vocational Rehabilitation Program and other partners, this is supporting the employer engagement. So there are now increased opportunities under the VR program uh, to work with employers and do this by providing work-based learning experiences for individuals with disabilities, that includes participation in apprenticeships and, um, and internships. So the VR programs work with local education agencies to supplement IDEA transition services by developing, expanding, and enhancing in-school, after-school, 
or summer work experience opportunities in diverse career pathways, meaning that that's going to lead to hopefully more um, meaningful post-secondary employment and training goals in that student's um, individualized education program, the IEP, or their individualized plan for employment, the IPE. It now uh, utilizes the expertise of VR business specialists and other workforce partners to identify early work experiences and job opportunities that are outside that traditional school setting. And having these um, happen in the local labor market so that there are increased opportunities to explore post-secondary training options, which in turn is going to lead to more industry-recognized credentials, skill gains, and meaningful post-secondary employment. And also allows for increased opportunities for the state VR agencies to support advanced training in STEM and other technical uh, professions. And also it allows us to now pay students competitive wages or training stipends for work performed during an employment um, experience. So I had just mentioned a little earlier that state VR agencies are required to set aside this um, portion of their federal funds to only serve and work with students with disabilities in the area of pre-employment transition services. So that was a great thing, allowing that um, student to get paid now. All right, now with this slide, um, this is kind of a visual that represents how the pre-employment transition services can be a first step along a career pathways continuum. So on the left-hand side of the page, uh, we see steps starting with pre-employment transition services. And there are five required pre-employment transition uh, service activities. Job exploration counseling, work-based learning experiences, counseling on opportunities for enrollment in comprehensive transition or post-secondary education programs, workplace readiness training, and instruction in self-advocacy uh, that can also include peer mentoring. This can provide that early start uh, to job exploration that allows students with disabilities to um, identify some career interests, um, moving on maybe to further uh, vocational rehabilitation program services. Um, but then the student can also follow maybe a career pathways approach, uh, building on work-based learning opportunities, such as attending a STEM camp or a career academy. Um, having an internship, then hopefully that leads down a path to a career industry uh, recognized credential, labor market skills that can transfer into higher quality employment outcomes within specific industry and occupational sectors. Um, ultimately, just having uh, these students with disabilities achieve greater um, and higher uh, employment outcomes over time. When looking at uh, WIOA uh, and serving youth with disabilities, uh, as Tessie mentioned, there's now this emphasis on obtaining credentials, um, being able to show measurable skill gains, and having uh, achievement of competitive integrated employment for all students with disabilities. There's increased opportunities for these students to practice and improve workplace skills in competitive integrated work settings before they exit high school. That really is critical for these, this population. Um, and it increases the opportunities for students with disabilities to explore post-secondary training options. Again, helping them uh, achieve more meaningful employment outcomes and, and training goals within their individualized education programs. It also now allows VR to share post-school employment and training outcomes uh, with the education system. So that may in turn positively affect district level reporting outcomes for all of the IDEA transition indicators, one, two, 13, and 14. We're going to hear a little bit 
more about this um, from Dale and Hunter and, and the experience that's happening in, um, in Delaware. So right now, um, this should be a handout uh, that you can probably download, I believe, on the uh, on this website uh, on this webinar. This is a crosswalk uh, between the VR performance indicators under WIOA and the IDEA um, transition indicators, and it's specifically this one's looking at the alignment between. Uh, for one and two. So the VR performance indicator on the left hand side for VR they need to show a percentage of participants enrolled in an education or training program who obtain a recognized post-secondary credential or secondary school diploma or the equivalent during participation in or within one year of exit from the VR program. On the right hand side we see that the IDEA Part B indicator, number one, shows the percentage of youth with IEPs graduating from high school with a regular diploma. So you can see with this crosswalk, VR can support the attainment of a high school diploma, and that may help decrease dropout rates. When we look at the next one, and I hope that it's <laughs> OK, there we go. Um, Oops, let me go back one. Indicator. Thank you. <laughs> indicator, uh, transition indicator 13. This is showing us how um, measurable secondary and post secondary goals, uh, while tracking and documenting courses of study and skills gained, may increase student performance and education outcomes. Because on the VR side of the house, um, we're looking at those number of participants who are in that education or training program who attain a residential or a secondary school diploma equivalent, again, within that one year or exit, and also the percentage of individuals who during that program year are in an education or training program that leads to a recognized post-second or employment outcome and who are achieving documented academic, technical, occupational, or any other forms of progress towards a credential or employment aligns with IDEA Part, Indi Part B Indicator 13, which is um, looking at the percentage of youth with IEPs. And <laughs> we just lost our screen. Thank you. Um, of measurable post-secondary goals, um, including courses of study that will reasonably enable the student to meet those post-secondary goals and allows for a, a representative um, from any participating, participating agency, and in this case it would be the VR agency, um, to have that evidence that shows that the student um, was not only invited to their own IEP team meeting, but that the ARC is invited to that team meeting um, as long as there's consent from parents and and looking at Christine, your audio is coming in and number out. Number fourteen. This shows that a, a crosswalk between uh, the VR program needing to show the uh, number of individuals who are in unsubsidized employment during the second quarter after program exit and employment during the fourth quarter after program exit and what those median earnings are for that participant uh, during that second quarter after exit and the number of individuals who have attained a um, recognized post-secondary credential or secondary school diploma or the equivalent during the participation in or within one year of exit after the program and also employed or enrolled in uh, some type of education or training program that leads to that credential within one year after exit. On the IDEA Part B Indicator 14, schools are needing to show the percentage of youth 
who are no longer in secondary schools had an IEP in effect at the time when they left that school, and they are then either enrolled in higher education within one year of leaving high school, enrolled in higher ed, or competitively employed within one year of leaving high school, or they're enrolled in higher education or some other post-secondary education training program or competitively employed. So you can see that successful transition planning that includes post-secondary employment goals with continued engagement and partnership between VR and education may increase a student's ability to perform and then both agencies being able to um, show that long-term education and employment outcomes. And finally, you know, um, VR and education are not the only partners and players at the table, but other WIOA partners um, have the same outcome measurements. So um, here we're just looking at some of those partners, and we see across VR agencies, um, when we're looking at states throughout the whole country, many states are not only working closely with their education partners, but they are also bringing um, their developmental disability agencies to the table, or their um, mental health agencies, their foster care systems, their juvenile justice systems, and looking at how they can all um, collaborate together to improve um, in individual and system outcomes uh, for students with disabilities. So um, again, for more information, please go to the WinTech website and specifically look at our pre-employment transition services area to further explore some of these outcomes and alignments and just find out more information. And with that, I'll turn it over to our next question. All right, thank you, thank Christine. You. And thank you for really highlighting in depth this the alignment among the measures and the outcomes between WIOA and IDEA. Um, we're going to just start a, a short poll, and, and as we're doing the poll, I'm going to just ask Christine some of the questions that did come through the chat box. But as we're asking, um, answering those questions, uh, just let us know, is your state currently addressing CTE, um, a CTE activity by partnering with special education and adult agencies? Now, Christine, we had a question, a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, will we actively seek persons with disabilities to participate in WIOA trainings? Are you aware of them? Mm, um, actively seek persons. Yeah, for example, in California, they're actively seeking veterans or those who've been separated from employment through layoffs. Um, Yes, so through your Title I partners, um, they have specific requirements under labor to, to target certain populations. Under the VR program, under Title IV, VR is, is specifically working, of course, with individuals with disabilities. And so um, I think as the law is, um, every year we're seeing more and um, the requirements, and you'll see that uh, the state VR agencies and the workforce partners um, are now working closer together to uh, see how they can braid funding and, and serve mutual customers. So that there's a mandate on, on both sides for working with specific populations. Okay. Um, and we're we're getting we have about half of our audience has participated in the the poll, so we'll just leave it open for another minute. We have a question: Is uh, what do you see as the future of apprenticeships for persons with diverse disabilities? Um, we actually have a um, topic area uh, within the WinTAC um, under um, the integration, uh, the workforce integration, and they are the, the individuals in that topic area actually are addressing um, the whole future of apprenticeships and the career pathways model. And I invite you again, go to the WinTech website, look under um, integration into the workforce. Um, but th that you're going to see more of this, uh, especially uh, we. I believe on the website there may be some uh, examples of specific um, states that are doing 
some innovation um, with the apprenticeships for people with um, disabilities. Okay, and then one more question before we close the webinar, or the, not webinar, sorry, the poll. Um, what is the, can you explain the difference between an integrated work setting and a sheltered work environment? Well, um, sheltered tells you just that. It's sheltered, it is um, segregated, so you would only have individuals with disabilities. Uh, it's not in a environment that's commonly found out in the community. Integration means that the individual with a disability is working alongside people without disabilities. They are afforded the same opportunities um, that everyone else has as far as advancement or uh, benefits uh, and wages. So uh, again, sheltered, uh, sheltered employment um, is segregated, you know, not in the mainstream, you're not gonna uh, walk into a mall and be able to find a, a, a sheltered <laughs> employment Great. opportunity. Okay. And we'll save some of the other questions for a little bit later in the session, but we wanna close the poll right now. Let's see our results. So you can see that a lot of folks are not sure about um, whether their state is currently addressing CTE. Um, a partnership between special education and adult agencies. Okay. And so we're going to hear from our colleagues a little bit later about some examples of what that might look like. So thank you all for participating in our poll and we're going to move on to our next portion. Um, let's see, sorry, moving slowly. So uh, our analysis, and we're going to move around the wheel. So we've done the top two parts, and we're going to talk about the bottom part. And so our analysis also revealed some opportunities for leveraging the act to provide pathways and supports to enable learners with disabilities to achieve college and career readiness uh, and success. And so one of those examples is personalization of student supports. And so here are some examples of leveraging across Perkins and WIOA for looking at transportation. We've got career counseling. Um, so thinking about this as a holistic sort of approach to providing supports, not uh, a single act can provide all of the supports, but uh, different acts can provide uh, different pieces of the supports for students. There are other um, supports that Christine also mentioned that are in here, which is the integrating um, family and student supports, uh, looking at career services that are, are available. And then also, how do we provide supports for students who are identified as homeless, um, who, who also may be uh, receiving supports through the foster care system? And then finally, the last part of our wheel, we looked at the uh, alignment across resources and supports that institutions uh, need to provide in order to enable learner readiness for college and career um, success. And here's a couple of examples um, about how institutions can really support uh, educators. You can see that ESSA and Perkins both provide opportunities for professional learning for both CTE and general education teachers. And at the same time, IDEA can um, support general ed and CTE teachers who are providing services to students with disabilities. Um, ESSA, WIO, and IDEA also allow for professional learning opportunities to teachers so that they can provide rigorous uh, academic instruction, as well as ensure that students develop social and emotional skills. So my colleagues, Dale and Hunter Matusevich, are going to share how they are leveraging, uh, the state of Delaware is leveraging and aligning the acts to ensure that students with disabilities are able to achieve career success. Dale? All right, thank you. So we're just gonna try to give a, a quick overview uh, of what we're doing here in Delaware uh, with our pipeline to career success for students with disabilities um, as we're moving forward. Um, as you can see, uh, we've all just went through that time of the year from an educational perspective where we want all of our students to, of course, graduate with those high school diplomas, with those credentials that were mentioned earlier, 
um, and go through that happy time uh, with as you you will, and also just ensure that they're ready for that next step uh, after secondary education. So one of the things that we began here in Delaware uh, about three, uh, four years ago is we started really working more uh, closely with our Department of Labor. We did a, a 10 year outlook on our employment statistics on where uh, our Delaware hires were gonna come from. So as you can look in this slide through our Delaware Pathways work, and you can find a lot of this work um, if you'll just Google Delaware Pathways. Um, the website is DelawarePathways.org. You'll find a lot of this initial information that I'm gonna be talking about. But as you can see, by 2024, within five years, Delaware is going to now replace, hire or replace about 30% of its workforce. So we're looking, a lot of that is coming from replacement um, and about 8% coming uh, through growth uh, as we go through. So we're looking at, at replacing about uh, uh, just over 143,000 workers uh, as we go through. So we want to make sure that that our Delaware residents uh, and students are ready to uh, step up to that challenge. We also worked with the Department of Labor. We broke this down uh, by, by county. Uh, yes, Delaware is uh, three counties only. Uh, so as we begin to work through this though, we began to really look at where are the skill levels for those uh, jobs? Where are, they, where are they gonna be at? As we know, over the years, the high skills have begin, began to climb, uh, but we're really looking at still, uh, for us, and, and looking at it, we thought we were in a prime opportunity from a, a special education end that, you know, around uh, 37 to 54 percent of those are still going to be low-skilled uh, jobs, uh, with about 32 to 35 percent becoming those middle-skilled jobs. So we're still going to need some type of education after high school, uh, whether that's going to a, a vocational school, whether that's a community college, or whether that may be a four-year uh, college or institution. So, um, so you can kind of see the statistics there. We're, we're going through a reform uh, with our CTE programming here, and it is all based off of um, our, our Department of Labor data. So one of the things that uh, we're really looking at um, as one of the questions that were asked earlier about the, the future of apprenticeships, especially for students with uh, uh, or individuals with diverse needs, as we're reforming our career and tech ed programs, and those programs are becoming uh, reauthorized, if you will, by the state, our new pathways were developed uh, in collaboration with our Delaware businesses. Each of them have a component to either have a, an apprenticeship, an internship, or some type of work-based learning program tied to them as the students enter their junior and senior years. So, so our, our outlook uh, for those types of, of experiences uh, is, is very uh, at the forefront. So here you can see these are some of our top, <clears throat> um, where some of our top uh, growth is going to be. Uh, within health science, uh, information technology, human services, uh, architecture and construction, education and training, finance and hospitality, of course. Um, we started this process with one high school and 27 students three years ago. We are now in, uh, we are up to uh, just over, I think, 20, we're right at 22 programs, new programs that's going to be implemented for the 1920 school year. Uh, and this past year, we were up serving uh, about 12,000 students, and hopefully at the end of next year, we'll have an impact on 16,000 students uh, coming through our schools, um, our, our high schools. So as you can see uh, by the next slide, uh, we are really bringing in those four components that Tessie talked about earlier or spoke about. Uh, rigorous academics, the workforce readiness skills, personalization of the student support and educator supports um, that are out there. So we're doing that through our, edu our, our career pathways um, and really that's where the focus of our pipeline work uh, is going to be uh, over the coming years. So this is our Delaware team uh, that's, that's looking at that. We have uh, representation from the um, 
Department of Ed from the Exceptional Children Resources Work Group, as well as the uh, Career and Technical Education and STEM Work Group. Our, one of our main partners is NAEP, uh, the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about them because we approached them about uh, adapting one of their models that's a proven uh, success for non-traditional uh, populations going into the workforce, into certain careers. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then also we are partnering with uh, Tilson and Diaz Solutions, uh, Dr. George Tilson and Dr. Carol Burbank. And then our other uh, team members uh, mentioning in, bringing in um, those other adult agencies. Uh, I've already mentioned the Department of Labor, but specifically the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, uh, Health and Social Services, our Division for the Visually Impaired, as well as uh, Developmental Disability Services. And we're also uh, being provided some support from NTAC or the National uh, Technical Assistance Center on Transition. So again, I think uh, our pipeline objectives fall right in line uh, with us trying to align our four major pieces of legislation and, and uh, ESSA, Perkins, IDEA, and WIOA. Uh, we're looking at increasing the number of students that we enroll in our career and tech ed pathways, those that are participating in work-based learning experiences, earning those college and career credentials, uh, graduating high school as a CTE pathway uh, completer, looking at those students that are continuing their education in whatever environment that may be, and they're entering in-demand employment uh, uh, after they leave us. So as we began this process, um, we had been doing some work from a career and tech ed in with uh, the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity uh, around their pipe model. Um, as we began that work, and we were about three years into that work, uh, and I was learning more of it from a special education end, we really looked at uh, and approached them about could we change their uh, pipe model, looking at those uh, populations going into non-traditional career pathways, women going into uh, STEM and construction trades, uh, men going into nursing and education. So as we approached them, uh, they agreed to allow us to work with them to adapt that model. So we're in the price process currently of adapting that model and have begun that process over this past school year with three of our uh, pilot districts that we have. Also looking at it, it's a multi-year professional development and technical assistance models for teams to really dig in and make data-based uh, decisions uh, that drive their work within their buildings and within their programs. So we are just in a, a year into the project or initiative at the current moment. These are some of the things that our pilot sites are saying. Um, and as you can see, it's really aligning with our district goals, uh, our school-based goals. Um, and, and that's all due to our alignment uh, around uh, ESSA, Perkins, IDEA, as well as WIOA and bringing those uh, four pieces of legislature together uh, or legislation together as we work through this and bringing in uh, more of our adult services at a, at a younger age than we have been in the past. So looking at, at the pipe process that we have, um, kind of going through this very quickly because we'll try to get more into the nuts, nuts and bolts, but it's, it's really uh, uh, action research around the clock, if you will. So we're asking teams to go in, explore and evaluate some of those things they're doing. They're really doing some, some deep data dives uh, into their data, and I'll give you a, a really good example or a couple of examples of that uh, and the impact that it's having for uh, programming. Um, they're really looking at discovering what that data is telling them um, as they move through uh, that process. Um, and, and really discovering uh, where those barriers uh, may be at for students. Then they're selecting those areas that they want to tackle, uh, putting an implementation or an action plan into to place and then they're acting on that action plan as they move forward. 
um, let's see, here we go. And again, it's if we're repeating this process on uh, continually, we're always looking at data. Yeah, I think Jessica I may find, I may have there we go. So so again, we're looking at the Perkins accountability measures, um, the academic attainment, the technical skills, school completion, graduation, placement, uh, and of course the participation and completion uh, in those programs of preparing students in non-traditional careers. Oh, if I can go back one, let's see. Here we go. Um, working with Nate, we pull, we from the Department of Education have pulled the district data for all of our schools that are participating. Um, and Nate has built us some of the best data dashboards that I've seen in my education career and being in education for over 20 years now. A lot of information at the, at the tip of a button uh, or a click of a button. And, and really allowing schools to go in and dig and dig deep into that data. Uh, for instance, as we were going through um, uh, some of that uh, data, we were looking at, and, and we had one of our districts that came on board were really kind of kicking and screaming, especially from a special ed and thinking they were doing a really good job. Their, their, their students are getting access to our CTE programs and all of that. At their end of the year presentation, one of the things that they mentioned as, as something that they really needed to work on and really see where the barriers were at, they had 0% of their students with disabilities were leaving career and tech ed programs with a credential, 0%. In addition to that, 0% were getting access to their work-based learning immersion program. They were very open and honest with us as they went through that process and said, if we would have not gone through this process and dug deeper into our data, we would have never realized that because on the, on the surface, they felt they were doing a good job. So one of the things that we have done through this process is we've uh, done an extensive literature review um, that can be found at the NAEP website that you're seeing on the screen. The full version is about 115 pages, um, but then we've also condensed that down into a table format to where it's uh, down into 18 root causes and then some interventions that uh, could be in place to tackle some of those. So again, we've done a lot of action research um, through a number of, of, of different methods as we've gone through to develop those root causes within the districts. And then I'm going to let you, Hunter, talk to you a little bit about those things that uh, that our adult agencies are helping us out with as they're coming to the table. Okay, so I'm going to kind of talk more along the lines of our pre-employment transition services and how we've kind of coupled that along with um, the process that we're going through with our CTE reform now. But um, how we kind of structure our pre-employment transition services in Delaware is we kind of have like two buckets. So we have what I call like our out of house services, which are with our service providers in the community, which or our contractors. And then we have our in-house pre ads which we've hired three because we only have three counties. So we've hired three pre-employment transition counselors to actually push into schools um, within each of our counties to provide services during the school day. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk about more of our in-house stuff as opposed to our contracts. So our in-house pre -ets, um, we kind of have, like I said, one in each county, and we're just responsible for those middles and high schools in those counties. And what we've done is we've set up a lead contact um, in each of our schools, and then we have meetings and we bring um, the teachers that the classrooms were pushing into, we're bringing in our district level people around special ed, CTE, or whoever it may be, guidance counselors that they want to appoint to kind of help with this process. And we've brought in um, DOE, other VR people, and sometimes depending on our schools and the populations we may be serving, we might bring in our developmental disability services or our visually impaired people to help that process. Um, and then as we go on from there, we kind of identify similar to those root causes we kind of go through a process to try to figure out what the school's already doing 
what they may be lacking, what their students may need, um, and also talking to some of our um, adult service providers, our project search sites, our 18 and 21 programs, anything that they may be transitioning into and where those gaps are. So we've kind of got our little root causes there that kind of guide our services within each of our schools. So as my job, um, we go into the schools once a week, depending on the school, from anywhere from about 45 minutes to an hour and a half and use whatever services we can or um, curriculums that we can, um, resources, whatever it may be to help deliver those services. Um, and then we also push into IEP meetings if we're asked to attend to kind of help guide the process of this is what we're seeing, this is what we're doing, make sure we can help take some of the load off of our teachers of you don't, may not have time to hit this with all of your students, but if I can push in once a week for an hour and a half and kind of take something off your plate, let me because it's a service that all the students may need and they're still individualized so we can kind of hop around together and make sure that they're hitting those services within their plans. Um, and we do a lot of planning around their IEP within those and making sure that they understand their IEP, making sure that they have input into their IEP um, and how that all works for them because a lot of our students don't know that they have an IEP or if they do, they have no idea what it does for them. So um, we hit across the disability spectrum and across age range from 14 to 21, um, significant students to students who are on our diploma track. So, so one of the things that I, that I will mention that, that uh, is our pre-employment transition counselors sat down with our schools and really, as Hunter said, look at those gaps and really look at where can we expand services. The other thing our adult agencies have done, especially through the pipeline project, is they have been at the table with us from the very beginning. Um, it is a shared funding uh, model uh, where all of us are coming to the table and, and kind of emptying our pockets. Um, but it also allows having our adult agencies at the table during the uh, initial discussions and, and as they progress, it allows them to understand education better. It allows us from education uh, to understand adult agencies better. And it allows us to begin uh, knocking down uh, some of those barriers that we're, we've been struggling with for years, but now we're, we've got everybody at the table and it's allowing us to break down those barriers as we work towards bettering our services um, for our folks. And our pre ex counselors are at the table, our transition counselors, uh, from BR at the table, our employment navigators and community navigators from developmental disability services, um, as well as our, our counselors from uh, the division for uh, the visually impaired are also sitting there with us. So again, I know we're running out of time, so uh, it's just looking at really, um, at, at, at again, these are the things that you'll do through that process. It's very prescriptive. Um, very, very structured. Um, we have three face-to-face -face meetings with uh, our schools that are involved during the year uh, to allow them to work across district lines. Uh, but we also have individual technical assistance with, them, with each of those uh, schools that are participating on a monthly basis. Very short, 45 minutes, stay to the agenda and move on uh, uh, to the next task. Um, so if folks want to get involved, uh, we are now in the, in the process of discussing with Nate uh, the possibility of, of writing a grant. We're looking for other states across the country uh, to partner with us in this to continue the work, not only here in Delaware, but to spread that work across the, the country. So if you're interested, we also do monthly or, or quarterly um, affinity or community of practice groups uh, discussing agencies working together to uh, ensure better programming for students with disabilities. If you'll contact me uh, via email, I'll be happy to get you on those work group lists or let uh, our NAEP folks know that you'd be interested in, part in potentially partnering uh, on the grant effort that we're getting ready to, uh, to embark on. So that's, that's uh, kind of our story and we're sticking to it. 
Thank you, um, both Dale and Hunter. Uh, I'm going to pass this over to my colleague, Beth uh, Ratway from AIR, and she'll share some strategies that, uh, that might be possible for braiding funds and resources across the app. Beth? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And I don't have, do you just want to go, you want to just click through the slides? Is that the easiest? I think you're, it's moving. You're good. What is? I don't think I made it happen. But <clears throat> anyways, just to honor our time. And you can just leave this one up, actually. Um, so you've heard a lot about really positive, concrete ideas and ways to think about the pieces of legislation that we've done an analysis on and the different components and how to tie it back to that bigger picture of college and career readiness. And it is, I mean, really focusing on it for all students. Um, but I, I, we wanted to come back to the big picture in terms of braiding all these pieces together and how can you do that properly. But I think the last two presentations really talked about how you could do that. Um, and you know that each of these pieces of legislation has its own intricacies, actually probably in your state has its own staff, um, but very rarely do they ever get time to talk to each other. You know, you're, you're so involved within SR programs or IDEA or RIOA. First of all, you're probably not in the same building. Second of all, it's difficult, even though you are working towards the same goals for college and career readiness, you aren't, you just don't have the time. And so what we just wanted to remind you is how you could maybe use this brief and how you could use some of these conversations to really think about what are the, where are there opportunities to look at the resources and what do these laws say that are in common that could actually braid things together. So, there we go. There. Um, <clears throat> So I think it's really important to step back and go, um, I think Dale really hit the nail on the head by talking about who he had involved, the different stakeholders and how they all emptied their pockets. Um, and there are two opportunities. If somebody's not gonna empty their pocket, there's opportunities that you can look at in terms of even just looking at the brief and highlighting areas um, where funding exists, um, what funding is tied to in, in each of these pieces of legislation, really important. And you can use the language of the legislation to say, hey, you need to pony up and come to the table. And that's where this braiding piece comes into, into play. If you look at, when you look at the brief, it's really essential uh, for each of the sections that have been outlined, um, particularly this one, it, you can go through and look at what each of the laws says, uh, particularly about resources and processes. Um, what does it fund? What are the processes that need to be involved? The really, the key elements across all four of these, and you probably know this, but is really it's about professional development um, and it's about working across legislation to do uh, integration how do you integrate pieces but you see in all four of these laws that there is professional development and the money and funding sh should go towards some type of professional development so how do you do that how do you break that how do you think about you know keep bringing the right people to the table and really being thoughtful about this work um, what you can do is really focused on that professional development piece. So everybody, no matter what organization that you're working with, the Workforce Development Board, employers, SEA, LEA, higher ed, um, um, community colleges, all need the professional development. If you can bring them together, have common professional development around building common language and building capacity, you could, that's one way to braid the different funding streams that are in, these legisl that, that are in this legislation. And the bonus of that is that human capital piece that allows you access to all different types of human capital. If you know and you do professional development, you usually do it on your own and it's hard. Um, and if you can bring in a collaborative effort to it and a, a community-based effort to it where you're involving workforce, workforce development, you're involving IATs and bringing everybody to the table, there's more human capital there to support that. Also the fiscal piece, which we just I just talked about, there are fiscal opportunities in all four pieces of legislation for professional development. That is one big key thing besides really integration um, that's part of this, and it's, it's critical. And the other piece are learning resources. When you bring people to the table and you braid these, those involved in all four of these pieces of legislation, you're bringing a lot of learner resources to the table that already exist that you might not know about. So that's where these all play a role in really thinking about professional development and some common professional development. 
one example that I want to share with you that I think is, is critical to this conversation. Uh, a piece of common ground um, in, in this work is employability skills, right? So we did a scan of work-based learning um, in all the different states and tried to figure out how they're defining work-based learning. And many of them are really just outlining knowledge and skills. Many of them are talking about it from a career pathways uh, 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 viewpoint. Many of them are talking about it just from a pure instructional strategy, that it's an instructional strategy that needs to be used. But a lot of them, over 12 of them, really talk about work-based learning uh, and, and house it with employability skills. I think that's a really good strategy and a common piece that spreads across all four pieces of legislation where you could do professional development across organizations, across those involved in all four pieces and really kind of bring together that fiscal, the human capital and learning resources um, to have a rich conversation from common ground, right? So uh, particularly when you're talking about um, college and career readiness across the board, but particularly with students with disabilities, it's critical to have that common ground. What's that center ground? And that's employability skills. We're trying to get them prepared for real world, no matter if they end up going to a community college, no matter if they end up going to the workforce. So how can you look at braining these four pieces of legislation to really support that? What are some common areas and one place to start with the employability skills? So it's just some food for thought in terms of um, pushing forward. It's one example of how you can look across all four pieces of legislation and try to bring them together towards a common purpose, even though they really are towards a, a college and career readiness. Um, if you get a little bit finer grain and really look at what are they all talking about? And they're all talking about employability skills in one way or another. Um, and how can you bring them together to bring funding together there, to bring resources together, to bring human capital together, to really make a difference for kids um, and getting them ready for the transition piece. Um, so that's what we really wanted to come back to the bigger picture and talk about um, how, the, how, do you, how can you look at these pieces of legislation um, from your own context and really think about bringing them together. They each bring their own value they each bring their own difficulties, but how can you work across it and how can you make a concerted effort, a really thoughtful effort to support kids in, in this transition piece by looking across all four of these, um, uh, these pieces of legislation to really support the work and move forward. Thank you, Beth. Um, and I apologize. I, I know Beth was a bit muffled. Um, Sorry. And, huh? <laughs> I didn't so, know why, sorry. That's okay. It, so we um, we don't have any questions right now um, for the attendees, but I did get a question about the PowerPoint presentation and resources. Those will be available with the recorded uh, presentation on the CCRS website. Following the uh, webinar, you will receive a direct link uh, where you can access all of those on the website. So if you do have any questions before uh, we close up, please submit them in the question box, and then I will share those with our presenters. I also posted Dale's email um, if you are interested in partnering so that you can contact him directly. Okay. <clears throat> Jessica, I'm just trying to go to the next slide. Okay. So um, many of you are probably thinking to yourself, so where do we go from here? And um, I just wanted to, to just share that it's important to remember that aligning ESSA and Perkins and IDA and WIOA is really essential as our presenters have indicated for creating a coherent education to workforce pipeline. And it really provides stakeholders an opportunity to think about how do we increase the efficiency and coherence and ensure that there's a seamless system of academic, technical, and employability skills. Um, we've also sort of highlighted that not one single act is able to meet the needs of, of uh, all students or an individual student, and that we really need to to figure out how do we leverage all of them to provide a comprehensive supports for students. I also wanna share 
um, a couple of resources. As I mentioned earlier, there are three resources that have been developed to help communicate the alignment opportunities and engage in conversations with your colleagues. The first is a, the brief that has been discussed today, and we've shared a couple of the particular pieces of it. Um, for the, within the document, as Beth mentioned, uh, each of the quadrants of the CCRS framework, you can see a theme for each of the acts are outlined below. And then you'll also find um, that there is a breakdown of the actual uh, summary tables of specific titles and sections within the law that you can use to leverage, where um, you can identify leveraging points. There's also a supplementary tool that may be useful. It is an Excel um, resource that's an interactive tool that allows users to search and sort the four laws based on the domains and indicators of the organizer. It, the tool has multiple tabs. The first one really is an introduction to the resource. The second tab provides directions for how to use it. And then the third tab is really the tool itself. And the purpose of the tool is to allow you to see the specific language of the law and then reference your own state or local plans to see how you can uh, leverage the acts uh, to address those particular requirements. And then the third resource is a state and local planning workbook. Um, in our poll earlier, 61 of you mentioned that you were not really sure what was happening in your state. 11% um, of you said that you know, nothing was happening. And this tool can really help you facilitate the conversations with teams to look at where you can identify um, opportunities and plan for potential opportunities to align college and career readiness efforts um, by leveraging the acts. And the tool is um, meant to be a sort of user-friendly tool and it is adaptable for your context. And then finally, there's some additional resources that you might find valuable. Um, the first is how ESSA and IDEA um, specifically can be uh, used to support CCR for students with disabilities. And it just looks unlike this brief looks at um, these two federal laws um, in much more in depth to look at how you can ensure that all students are college and career ready. And it also provides examples of model programs. The second tool is um, supporting work-based learning implementation. It is a self-assessment and can help work-based learning providers really identify strengths and opportunities um, within your own systems. And then finally, the last one is a cross-state collaboration on increasing access to industry experts in high schools. And this document shares promising solutions. Uh, for participating states to address um, their challenges. So it was a group of 11 states that came together and they looked at challenges and, and solutions in supporting industry experts in innovative roles and then leveraging this post-secondary partnerships um, in faculty with the goal of advancing work um, in the states. And I'm going to check um, and I don't see any other additional uh, questions. Um, but if you do have any questions following the webinar, please contact us um, at CCRS uh, through our website. Oops. Um, and we would like to thank our attendees. And I definitely want, um, want to give a special thank you to our presenters for participating in today's webinar. As a reminder, following the webinar, you will receive a survey eliciting your feedback about your experiences today. And if you would like to learn more about what you've heard today, um, I know some of you are looking for specific examples or you're looking for models, please visit our website at www.ccrscenter.org. Um, please enjoy the rest of your afternoon and thanks again.